So on one and two, we're going to substitute. So on one, I want to plug in a zero for x. So I do zero squared minus five. I get negative five, and that's my answer. So these first two questions should be really easy because we're just taking the number and plugging it in. So this one is a little bit more work, but you actually can put this in the calculator and it'll give you an answer. Um, if, you, if you just put what's underneath, you get 121, and then the square root of 121 is 11. It's always a good idea to just put it in without the square root in case this isn't something that's a nice square root so that we could simplify it um, so that we wouldn't have to get a decimal. So our answer there is 11. On three and four, these also shouldn't be that difficult. It says that we want to do it algebraically, which means we will have to show some work. And the work we're going to show is that we're going to factor uh, the top and the bottom if, if we could. This only factors on top. So we're going to say what multiplies to get 10, the adds to get 11. 10 and 1, which is convenient because now something will cancel. The x plus 10s, which means I have the limit as x approaches negative 10. Is it always going to be convenient? Uh, yes. If it says algebraically, it should be convenient. Technically, there's a small chance it's not because it does say if it exists. But I'm probably going to give you one where it's supposed to cancel out. Now, because we don't have an issue on bottom anymore with plugging in negative 10, we can just plug it in. Negative 10 plus 1 is negative 9. And number 4 is really similar. We're just going to factor and plug in. If you look at the graphs of these, what happens is that there's a hole where they're asking us to evaluate the limit. So you can probably pretty easily figure these out graphically. The problem is it asks you to do it algebraically, which means I need you to show this step where you factored. Otherwise, you didn't do it the right way. Multiplies to get negative 35 and adds to get 2 would be 7 and negative 5. So the x minus 5s cancel. So we just have x plus 7. So we plug the 5 in and get 12. When we are doing limits graphically like this, um, if they give us the graph, that means that they can be super tricky with what they give us. Like number 5, if they had given us the equations, this would look really, really weird. But since they just gave us the graph, we don't, we're none the wiser as far as the weirdness happening. Um, with that. What I care about with limits is that it meets from both directions. And so it doesn't matter that this is an open circle for a limit. If I asked you what f of 0 was, you'd have to tell me that that's undefined or something. Because at 0, my function has a hole. But that's not what they asked me. They asked me the limit. So I just care what it's getting close to. So it's getting close to a y value of 0 from both directions. So what we're looking for with limits is, do they meet like this one did? Or you know, if we had this situation, where coming from each direction, they're not even meeting up, that means the limit doesn't exist, things like that. So the problem on number six is that as we come at it from both directions, we are actually headed, like if I look from the negative, I'm headed toward negative infinity. And if I look from the positive, I'm also headed toward negative infinity. Now, so those are both headed toward the same thing. So I would actually accept two different answers on this. On my key, I said it did not exist. And the problem with this is because um, I don't know what these equations are. So I don't know if one of them is getting to negative infinity faster than the other one. But because they are both going to negative infinity, if you wrote negative infinity as an answer, I would take that. Because they are both going to the same thing. And that's what we care about with limits, is that they're going to the same thing. So either of these answers I would be OK with. Does not exist is D and E or negative infinity. That was 2.1. So now we're on 2.2. 
So on 2.2, we mostly looked at graphs, but that doesn't mean that we can't also use our equations to help us. So I'm going to graph using um, Desmos, but I'm, you would do the same thing just with your actual graphing calculator. So if I graph number 7, x squared plus 3x plus 19 over x cubed plus 2x squared plus 10, it asks me as I go to infinity what's happening. And so on my graph, on my TI-84 or whatever, I would probably press trace and then trace along this graph as I'm headed to the right. And so what I'm looking at as I head to the right is what is the y value doing? What number am I getting closer and closer and closer to? And the farther I go, the smaller my decimal, so I'm headed toward 0. So that is my answer to this limit is 0. Now we can actually figure that out just by looking at the leading coefficients on top and bottom. x squared over x cubed cancels out to be what? x on bottom. Now, that's not really how canceling works. But what happens is this whole thing, the in behavior is based off of that 1 over x. If I try to do 1 divided by a really, really, really big number, I get 0. Okay. If you do 1 divided by 1,000 and then 1 divided by 10,000 and you keep going, the bigger the number on bottom, the closer I get to 0. So anytime the bottom exponent is bigger than the top, this should approach 0. So you can actually do it graphically or you can just look at it and know. On 8, if we graph it, And we look at positive infinity. And again, if we press trace and then come over here, the problem on this one is I'm at negative 3 point something, and I may have to scroll a while to actually tell what it's getting close to. And maybe I don't want to do that. And the table on these have been showing fractions, and that's not super helpful. So again, if we look back at our equation, and we look just at the leading coefficients on top and bottom, and we think about those canceling, that cancels out to be negative 4. Well, guess what? That's where the horizontal asymptote is. It's at negative 4. Yeah, Laramie? Were you always going to do like, the, the biggest exponent? Thing? The biggest exponent on top and the biggest exponent on bottom. So if they had this rearranged, we'd have to pay attention. Like both of these, they were at the very front, but you'd have to look and find the biggest exponent on top and bottom. In these two cases, we had, we had bigger on bottom, we had the same, so if it's bigger on top, just so you know, then we're going to equal either positive infinity or negative infinity, depending on our graph. Um, so that, again, I want you really to look at the graph, but also look back at the equation to see if that helps you. Um, that's the easiest way to do it, is like a combination of the two things. Um, 9, 10, and 11 all go together. Those are all the same graph, so hopefully you didn't accidentally graph it three different times. But hey, whatever. And what we want to do is the limit as we go to negative 2 from each direction. So negative 2 from the negative direction means I come from the left and I go toward negative 2. As I get close to negative 2, my graph is headed down to negative infinity. So my answer on 9 is negative infinity. Well, we should uh, remember that if our asymptotes are going, if it goes away from each other like this, our asymptote, that means our answer from the other direction must be positive infinity. Because see, it goes up as I come from the positive direction. <coughs> So they ask from the negative, they ask from the positive, what is the limit overall if I don't get the same answer for these different directions? That means it does not exist. And then 12 is pretty easy. 
because it just asks us what the vertical asymptote is and you can easily graph it and figure that out or you can just set the bottom equal to zero and solve and either way our vertical asymptote is x equals negative four the only way that problem could be more difficult is if we had to factor to find it because maybe there's more than one vertical asymptote um, so either way that should be pretty easy kind of like what's happening on 13 we would factor the bottom of 13 um, so what multiplies get 24 that adds get negative 11 right And so that means that at 8 and 3, it's discontinuous, which means I'm going to put from negative infinity to 3, and then from 3 to 8, and then from 8 to infinity. Now, I just did that by hand. You can technically graph that and get the same thing. You just have to look for where the asymptotes are. The only time that doesn't work is if there's a fraction happening where our asymptotes are, it's a lot harder to actually find that number. For instance, on 14, if I just graph um, y equals the square root of 5x plus 8, on your calculator, you should be able to tell that it's somewhere in between negative 1 and negative 2, but you don't really have a good way of figuring out what that point is um, unless you go back to the equation. I can tell on this because this is like a super awesome calculator that it should be at negative 1.6, but this calculator is not available during the test. So what we want to do is set this equal to zero and solve to figure out what that number is where we're starting. Because we want to know where this is continuous. So we want to know where do I draw this? So I start drawing at negative 1.6 and go to the right. But to figure that out, I have to subtract 8. We're ignoring the square root here because we could um, square it away anyway. Divide by 5, we get x equals negative 8 fifths, which is negative 1.6. Either of those numbers is fine. Um, negative 1.6 is a nice decimal, so I don't mind you using it. So what we would do is we would say that we're continuous from negative 8 fifths to positive infinity. Negative 8 fifths gets a bracket because there's not a hole at negative 8 fifths. It's actually there at negative 8 fifths. And if you weren't sure, once you figure out it's negative 8 fifths, you can press trace and type it in and press enter, and it'll tell you this point that I have up on here. If it wasn't really supposed to be a bracket, it would give you just a blank next to it. Um, 15, find the points of discontinuity. This is basically the asking us like the opposite of 13. We do it the same way. We still factor but or look at our graph, but what it wants is just for us to say what those points are and what kind, what type of discontinuity. So what multiplies to get 35 and adds to get negative 12, negative 7, negative 5. Now if something canceled, remember that's a whole. Since nothing canceled, we have vertical asymptotes at 7 and at 5. But if like x minus 5 had been on top and those canceled, that's a whole. So that's a removable discontinuity, not, a, not an infinite discontinuity like both of these are. These are both asymptotes. So I factored, but I also could have just gone to my graph and looked at, or looked at my table of values to see where the errors were on this. So we are now to 2.4, 16 and 17. We need to use the slope formula that's, that's basically like our slope formula we've always used, the f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And so what they do is they give us a and b in this, in this set of brackets, and they give us a function, and we're just going to plug in. So I need to know what f of 7 is by plugging in 7, 49 plus 21, which is 70. And then I need to plug in 5. And really, I can plug those in in either order, as long as I put them in the right spot on the top of my fraction. Yes, 40. You're right. So I need to do 70 minus 40 over these two numbers subtracted, 7 minus 5. So I get 30 over 2, 
which is 15. Now, 17, 4 plus cosine x. I need to find f of pi. So 4 plus cosine pi, I need to know what cosine pi is. The thing is, is if I'm using numbers like 0 or pi or even like pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2, those should either be 0, 1, or negative 1 because those are our quadrants on our unit circle. So if I think about my unit circle over here at pi, this point is negative 1 comma 0. Cosine uses the x value. So over at pi, cosine is negative 1. So this is 4 plus a negative 1, which is 3. For f of 0, I do 4 plus cosine 0. And I would think about over here at 0, what is cosine doing? Here it's a positive 1, so that's 4 plus 1, which is 5. So I need to do 3 minus 5 over pi minus 0. So that gives me negative 2 on top and pi on bottom, and I would leave it as that answer. I don't need you to turn that into a decimal for me. I'm fine with that. <coughs> then the last page is, the, is what we did on Friday. So these three questions all require us to use that formula. The limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So there's two formulas that we need to memorize that we've never memorized before, although one of them that's technically not true. One of them is this f of b minus f of a over b minus a. The other one is this, this formula. Like I need you to memorize it so that you can use it on the test. So if we want the slope of the line tangent to the curve at x equals negative 4, I'm going to plug in negative 4 for x for my first step. So f of negative 4 plus h minus f of negative 4 over h. Now that means I'm plugging negative 4 plus h into this fraction. So I have negative 1 over negative 4 plus h plus 6 because I just stuck that where x is. So I still have the negative 1 on top. I still have a plus 6 on bottom. Then I'm going to subtract. Now I think it's better if you just go ahead and plug in negative 4 like separately somewhere or graph it and look at it or something, but figure out what this is. Don't write it out right here. Okay, Negative 1 over negative 4 plus 6 is a negative 1 half. So I am subtracting a negative one-half, which means I'm really adding one-half. This was f of negative 4. Because if you're doing it right here in this work, it's a lot easier to not mess with this negative correctly. These are going to cancel and become positives. Now we can do something right here. Negative 4 plus 6 is a positive 2. Also, this is still all over h, and I was supposed to put the limit as h approaches 0. Sorry. So, negative 4 plus 6 is 2, so that's 2 plus h on bottom. I have plus a half, and now I'm ready for common denominators. So, the first fraction needs the second denominator. So this needs to get multiplied by 2. The second fraction needs the first denominator. So I'm going to multiply it by 2 plus h. <coughs> and that always works. You really don't have to think about these common denominators at all. You're just going to flip-flop multiplying. So negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. I'm going to write plus 1 times 2 plus h, 
because if I still had that minus sign there, I'd have to distribute that. Now that's not gonna matter on this one because it's a plus one, but we do need to make sure that we write it like that as whatever this sign is times whatever this number is, or whatever this sign is with this number because it has to go together. My common denominator is my two denominators, two times two plus h put together, we're all over h. So on top here, this one doesn't really matter. I can get rid of the one and the parentheses so that I really have negative two plus two plus h. So just h on top. Now, this is where we take the h that's on bottom, we say that's like h over one, and we multiply by the reciprocal. We say instead of dividing by h over one, I want to multiply by one over h, because that's how we divide fractions. That means these h's can cancel out, one on top, one on bottom. So I am left with one, and I can distribute or I don't have to, and it's really completely up to you whether you distribute the denominator or not. I also could have distributed it earlier if I'd wanted to. That's not a big deal. Now I plug in zero and get one fourth. So that is the slope of this graph at x equals negative four. What I could do to try and check to see if I'm anywhere close to right is I could graph this and look at x equals negative four and say, does it look like that would be a slope of one fourth or did I completely screw that up and get it wrong? Um, if you wanted to check yourself. I get that this is complicated and a lot of work, but every single time you have a fraction, it should be the exact same steps. So if you're not getting it now, you need to practice where you're looking at one that's worked out and trying to remember what to do next in each step. That's all it asked me to do on this one. These next two ask us to do the same thing, but they actually want equations of certain lines. Like this one's the equation of the tangent line. So that's like part B that we did. The problem is we don't know the slope, so we're still gonna have to do part A. So we're gonna use that formula. And this time X is two. We're plugging it into x squared minus x. So that means that I'm going to have two places to plug in two plus h. I have to do two plus h squared minus two plus h. Because that's x squared minus x. That's that whole function. Now, I'm going to plug in a two here and just work out what is two squared minus two. Which is four minus two, which is two. That is f of two. So I'm at the end here just going to subtract a two. This is where if you if you had put um if you had put minus and then plugged in two, if you do this, you're gonna get it wrong because what we need is parentheses around this so that we know to do this part first and then to put the negative with it. So I would just do it separately and put in the number you get. All right, we need to FOIL 2 plus h uh, times 2 plus h, which hopefully we're getting pretty good at because we've done that quite a few times now. That's 4 plus 2h plus h squared. I need to distribute this negative, so negative 2 and minus h, and then this minus 2 is still out here at the end. And this is where the, the canceling happens. This 4 and then two negative twos make zero when you put them together. This two h and this negative h, I can subtract those and get one h. And then I still have h squared on top as well. It's over h. What we're doing on this next step is we're factoring the h out on top so that we can cancel it with the h on bottom. So that's h times one plus h over h so that those cancel. If you just want to think about it, like if I divide h into both of these, h divided by h, this part, that's one, this part gives me h, so that's how I'm getting one plus h. If you wanna skip the step where you factor because you can do that, that's fine. Now I'm ready to plug in zero. This is one plus zero, which is one.
so I box that. That's not my answer. What am I doing? It's not. That's the slope. I need the equation. It's almost my answer. That's m. We need the equation of the tangent to the curve at the given point. So at 2, my y value, I already figured out that that was 2. And so if I didn't know that at this point, I'd either plug 2 in to figure that out so I can get the point, or I could graph x squared minus x and get that point. But now I'm ready for point slope form. So y minus 2 equals 1 times x minus 2. Or I don't really need that one there. I could have just left it as y minus 2 times equals x minus 2. That's like really easy to solve for y if you want to solve it for y. But you don't have to. So that's just y equals x. That's why foiling is really important, foiling correctly. So here, this is supposed to be 4h. Because if I foil 2 plus h times 2 plus h, I should have gotten 4h in the middle. That's, that's my bad. So 4h minus h gives us 3h here. And so instead of having 1 plus h, I should have had 3 plus h. So I should have had 3 plus 0 which is 3. I apologize if you erased what you had thinking that I was right. I appreciate your confidence in me. It was just slightly misplaced in this one instance. Hopefully, hopefully one instance. So that's a 3 and that's why that didn't seem familiar to me, that answer. So y minus 2 equals 3 times x minus 2. Now I just made a mistake that was a really easy mistake to make. And in, if I hadn't already done the problem before, I would have no way of knowing that I had done it wrong unless I looked at the answer key. So you may be asking yourself, like, that's a mistake I could make. So what if I made that mistake? I would take like one point off for that. Like that would not mean that you missed most of the points on that problem because all you did was a really simple math error. And so that doesn't mean that you get the entire problem wrong. So if you're looking at these problems saying, there's no way I'm going to get the right answer, that may be the case, but you can at least get through part of this. You can at least plug it into the formula and then hopefully do this next step. And even this next one, like this right here. But then if you get stuck, like try something. If it doesn't all work out, like you know what's supposed to happen. So you can even write that down. And this is in general for math classes. Like if a professor you have or whatever, they want to know, do you know that everything's supposed to cancel so that your H is gone on the bottom? I mean, that means you learned something, even if you couldn't actually get all the way to the end of the answer. So keep that in mind whenever you're working through this stuff. And 20. The normal line, that's where we took the slope and we flipped it and made it the opposite sign. So it's like we're doing part A and part C from the homework. Um, they gave us 3 comma 36. That just means x equals 3. You can ignore the 36 for now. We'll be able to use it later. They already told us the whole point. That was nice of them. Um, but we don't need it right away. It's just x is 3. So let's work this out. Hopefully better than the last one. So 3 plus h minus f of 3 over h. We're plugging into 4x squared, which is actually not too terrible. So this is 4 times 3 plus h squared, and then we need to minus f of 3. Now, they already told us f of 3, because f of 3 is 36. When I plug in 3, I get 36. So I need to do minus 36 here. If I didn't realize that they'd given it to me, I'd plug 3 into x and get 36, and I'd be like, oh, that was silly. They told me what it is. Now we need to FOIL 3 plus h and then multiply by 4. So 3 plus h is 9 plus 6h plus h squared. And then the 4 is still on the outside, and I need to distribute that 4 which is good because that's how we're going to get a 36 to cancel out. 4 times 9 is 36. 4 times 6h is 24h. 4 times h squared is 4h squared 
minus 36 over h. This one is, I feel like, faster than the last one because we didn't have that extra term. The 36's cancel out. An h is going to cancel out if you wanted to just skip straight to the step where you said this would be 24 plus 4h, that's fine. Or if you want to go ahead and write out the step where you factor the h out of this, that's fine too. We just take the h out. Now you can actually take more than h out. You can take a 4 out as well. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine. We'll get the same answer when we plug in 0 here. 24 plus 4 times 0 is 24. So the slope of our tangent line is 24. We want the slope of the line that's perpendicular to that. And so that means I'm going to change this to negative 1 over 24. And that's going to be my slope. They already told me the point to use, 336. So just plug it into point slope. And um, this is why we don't really bother solving for y, because this is some really lame fraction for our y-intercept that I didn't even, I, I kind of found it on the answer key, but I actually gave up and just like wrote it as a mixed number because I didn't really feel like figuring out what it was. So that's it.